get this, maybe use this. Okay, so I've got a very interesting topic, and that is how to build a higher education brand. So I thought I would start with, um, let me just list down a few brands. And many of these you probably are familiar with. Uh, do you know there is a brand that's recently made a hijab for Muslim women? Which brand made it? Nike made it, right? So for Muslim athletes. So people who want to run, who want to... So you can just see how brands have started to innovate. So my topic is how do you build an educational brand? You know, I want to say a couple of things before I actually get started. First is, I don't see a big difference between a commercial brand and an educational brand. I think the challenges are quite similar. And it's similar because for a commercial brand, it's a CEO who's probably trying to run the organization. For an educational brand, it's the director, the dean, or the president. So here is what is a brand, right? So this is David Aker's definition of what's a brand. And so Aker's point is, you know, so it's a promise. It's a brand promise. We're talking brand promise in this case. And we're looking at emotional self-express and social benefits. It's a journey in evolving relationship, right? OK. So let's kind of move on from here. What does Steve Jobs say? He says a brand is simply trust. Simply trust. I happen to, I'm not a branding professor, I'm a film prof, but I love brands because I tend to use a lot of these brands. So I do like brands, but let's just see where we go from here. Here are some schools. I picked up, we picked up a few schools. And uh, there are two schools. There's one school surely that I was associated with. I worked in two top Ivy League schools, and both schools are not very old schools. They're reasonably young schools, but they've done some amazing work. So you have Cambridge, you have Harvard, Stanford, HKUST, one of the top schools in Hong Kong, uh, Melbourne, Monash, two very, very good schools, top schools in the world again. Wharton, I picked a few, we picked a few Indian schools, XLRI, Tapni, of course, my school, and uh, SPGen and ISB. So here are some schools. Now, let's have a look at why these schools are important. What have they done different? Hmm? So people do not buy goods and services. They buy relations, stories, and magic. So let's have a look at the inception for these schools. Okay, so we have Cambridge, early 1200s, Harvard Business School, 1600. My previous school, Melbourne, is 1958. IAMS, Tapney, 1980, and then there's ISB, 2001. So the question is, if you said that you know Harvard is Harvard, Stanford is Stanford, and Cambridge is Cambridge because they're so old, then by that token, the first university which is 1088 Bologna should be the best university in the world. They're not even ranked. Institute Bologna was founded in 1088. They're not even ranked in the top 200 in the world. Right? How it's, you can say, well, it's Cambridge. Look at Cambridge, 1200. Well, take ISB, for example, 2001. They're very well known. So my school in Melbourne, 1958, top 10 in the world and top 20 in the world in multiple disciplines. It's only 60, 70 years old. So age, in my view, has got nothing to do with you know, how the brand has become a brand. Yeah, Harvard surely is, is 1600. So many, it's taken a lot of ways for Harvard to become Harvard. So let's see. What are the brand influences for education stuff? For institutions like ourselves, so if you take faculty, you take infrastructure, you take alumni, innovative pedagogy, you know, are degree schools, are they accredited, are they innovative schools? I mean, we spoke a lot about the entirety of the panels, spoke about innovation, adaption, that. If you really don't innovate, you will become redundant. Very, very simple. I'll tell you why. There are so many schools in this country, right? India has got like roughly 4,000 business schools. True. Now, if these 4,000 schools, or the 4,000 schools, probably nobody ever bothers to know what is after school number 40 or 50. And I, I don't even know. I, I probably get to know the top 20, 25 at best, right? So these schools, they're competing for the same brilliant minds. Now, if we sit there and say we're only going to textbook stuff, guys, what we did in 1920, nobody will ever care. And so for schools to be relevant, relevant, not become redundant, you've got to be extremely innovative. And that's where schools like Tapney play an amazing role. So why would we do it? Because we know that for a student, it just cannot anymore be Let's derive the capital surprise scene on the whiteboard and let the students take the books and go home. Schools have to now think about how do we innovate pedagogically? What are the kinds of things we can bring to the classroom? How can the learning be so student-centered? For a commercial brand, it's the consumer, right? For us, it's you. For us, it's you. It's exactly the same thing, right? So for example, if, I, if we could boast of the top 10 in the world and say, 
A, listen, we have A, B, C, D, E, F, and they're all based on top positions in the world. We're going to take a lot of pride in saying that. You will think, wow, if this guy could, Satya Nadella could do it, go, went to NU, is now you know, on Microsoft and all these big, big people, big places, maybe I could do it too. So why do you think schools take the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Bill Gates, all these people, they're associated with Harvard Business School, and they have a very good reason why they say themselves at Harvard, and they give a lot of endowment. Today, Harvard, you know what's the endowment of Harvard? It's over $30 billion. There were over $30 billion in endowments. With that much money lying. And they have a person called Drew Faust. Drew Faust is the president of Harvard, a woman president of Harvard, and they picked Drew Faust to head Harvard because they wanted somebody who can build consensus. So for a very, very good business school, you also need to have a great leader. That's important. So we have faculty, renowned faculty, obviously very good infrastructure, no question, excellent RMI, pedagogical innovation, so we have a double, you see the logo on the right, WCSB? There are only five schools in the country that have it, right? So we, that is a signal of quality. So when, when students apply to these schools that have got a WCSB, or in India we call them single crown, double crown, triple crown, it is a clear signal. We are communicating to you. It's a signaling hypothesis that we are a classic business school. We are one of the best business schools in the world, or at least in the country for sure. Innovation. We'll talk about that a little later. So let's look at some brand names. So we've got three good examples here. One is Tapme, which is our school, which is named after the founder of the school. And then in India, you have a lot of schools like IMs and IITs and NITs, which are probably largely center-funded. That is center-funded, I mean government-funded schools. They have tons of money with them, right? And then we have a real example of a niche kind of business school, XRI, where they specialize in kind of labor relations and stuff. Okay, so now these three business schools are different. Now, if you take an IM A, B, C versus one of the very new IMs, how do they operate? Now, they're all the same, right? Probably not. So we're looking at a founder, alumni, very renowned faculty, director. So there's this whole set of correlation and combination that happens when you look at the, the schools and how schools get connected and how the brand is kind of, you know, brand promises kind of delivered. So let's have a look at some challenges. Obviously, there are lots of challenges. Now, it's never easy to, come to, to run a school or to run an institution with the challenges. The first is, you know, for, I think this, the, one of the misconceptions, a myth rather, is branding means advertising and branding means marketing. I'm sure it's not. For a, for a film prof, I know this for a fact that it is not, right? So a lot of people say, I'm branding, and they have these brochures, and they send out some stuff, and they think they're branding. They're actually not branding. It is mere advertising. It's not branding. So conventional marketing wouldn't work. And you know, for a lot of business schools, for example, the top 20 schools, everyone is fighting for the same set of good students. So for a school to upscale in short span of time also may not happen. Imitability factor. So if, if I could have 16 criminals, and if you had tons of money in your school, you could have 24. But just by having no Bloomberg terminals, are you doing something different? Uh, so certain things are imitable, right? So, so for example, somebody once said, if you can't be creative, copy it, right? So I can't be creative, so I'm going to look at somebody else. I'm going to copy those schools and see what we can do different. Then alumni belonging. This is an extremely important point for business school and surely for, for schools in India where the mentality is not to actually give. A lot of the Western schools do very well because the alums are very serious and very generous donors. And so they have, they're extremely well connected to the, to the institution. Long after they've left the school, they take a great amount of pride in doing that. So for a business school to be successful, you also have to have a great set of alumni, and that's important. The belonging is the pride, the ownership is very important. Okay, so let's look at, is price a matter for people? I mean, is really, for example, I know ISB charges, 37 lakhs for an MBA program. Now, people who want to go to ISB don't, won't really care about the price, and neither would they care about the fact that they may not be placed, right? No school ever guarantees they're going to have 100% placement. They don't have to have it. There is no contract between a school and a candidate that you will be placed. If it happens, it so happens. There are lots of people, I'm sure, even in IMA, who probably haven't got placed. And many of them probably have gone up to do their own startups or whatever. So my point is price is not a precondition for students. So, so if, they, if they feel the school is the right school for them, they will pay. A very simple example. 
when I was heading the department in Melbourne, I know that we, I, we saw a program called Master of Applied Finance. And we doubled the fees, thinking that we didn't want too many numbers in the, in the cohort. We already had our numbers. We wanted to cut down the numbers. So we doubled the actual fee. And that was an exorbitant amount. We doubled the fee, and we got double the number of applications, which we didn't want, right? Because people felt, hey, the fee has been doubled. It's a cool. They're doubling the fee. There must be good quality. And obviously, it was good quality. So for many people, price is never an issue. For example, you're the top 20, 30 schools in the country. Banks would come to your house to give you a loan. Go, 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 go study, right? Education loan. So that's, that's also not a problem for a lot of people. So an institution's actual quality is often less important than its prestige, reputation for quality, because it's the university's perceived excellence. You know, my colleague, Guraj Khadir, and others, Simon George in the morning, also spoke of perception, perceived excellence which in fact guides the decisions of prospective students and scholars considering offers of employment. And this is a very US setting, because in the US and in the West, the schools get a lot of funding depending on where you're ranked. In India, for example, schools like us, which is a private school, we get no government funding, right? We, our funding is completely based on well, what the revenue we get from the fee. So we have no government funding. But in the West, your quality, and the funding is directly relevant. Because if you're a really high quality school, the government will actually pump in more money. And please remember, the schools that I listed earlier are all private schools. Private schools, except Harvard's a private school, right? Now, Cambridge is not a private school. But then look at, for example, my, my two schools in Melbourne, they're all public schools. Public schools do amazingly well in the West. Why? Because the government has an absolute eye on what these schools are doing because the federal government is pumping a lot of money. They want to make sure there's a, there's a student satisfaction, there is very high research quality. So you don't have to be a private school to be able to do things. As a public school as well, you can be one of the top Ivy League schools. But Harvard is not, right? But they have a lot of freedom to do, to do what they want. So innovation, again, the panel where my colleague was there, Guraj Kirinada, spoke about innovation. So innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. What, what separates the men from the boys? Right? What separates the men from the boys is the fact that you're continuously innovating and you're not really relaxing. The minute you start relaxing and you become complacent, for example, tapping is a great example. We can now sit back and say, hey, we, got, we are probably the only other school in the country other than, uh, I, uh, than ISB to have row back-to-back double ACSB. It is a Herculean task. I come from school that has triple crown. So we can relax, but we won't. Because we know that once complacency sets in, you will not be able to do a very good job. So innovation, you've got to continuously innovate. And that's why I keep repeating, there is no difference between a commercial brand and an educational brand. It's identical. The challenges are identical. The complexity is identical. Uh, in a commercial brand, we're dealing with consumers, and we're dealing with students. So you have to innovate. So brand promise, we spoke of brand promise. So for instance, what is it for tapping? What, what, what do good business schools do? Obviously, we want to have an excellent set of faculty. Academics play an important role. The experience, student experience, incredibly important because if you have a lousy experience in a school, you are never going to be telling anybody good thing about that school. The word of mouth is going to be really, really bad. So student experience is extremely important. And the image of the school. What are the kinds of things the school has done? How many competitions they win? You know, what, what kind of reputation these people have? Now remember, we are also dealing not just with the global accrediting bodies. We're also dealing with ranking agencies in the country, right? So the Business World, the Times, the Today, number of other agencies that actually continuously rank business schools. They also play a very important role. So, so the, the directors, the management of business schools have got to also deal with them because if a school goes from rank number 10 to rank number 20, so here is an example. Let's say, for example, on some metric, TAPME is number one, and I'm Ahmedabad is number 20. Would you believe that? It's possible. It's surely possible. Now, the minute the ranking agency does it, you're going to start questioning them. Harvard is number 20, but say Brown is number one. You would never believe it because, you know, any time a uh, world ranking comes out, a free ranking comes out, Harvard is one, Chicago is two, Princeton three. So it's a ranking almost preset, right? So the ranking is played an incredibly important role. That's why the image matters a lot. So we look at what else? Intake, intake of students, that is the quality of students, the confidence that we have. Do we have a unique sense of identity? 
what are the values and culture of the institution? That's equally important to be able to deliver a really, really good brand. So three elements that I think we should talk about uh, here in our setting at least makes sense is how transparent are you? Uh, what kind of uniqueness do you have? And what is your legacy? And very good business schools like Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, all these schools, they have a fantastic legacy, right? And they're also very transparent. For example, the students sit on the top uh, decision-making body, and TAPME does it as well. So recently, the top decision-making body at TAPME is, for example, the strategy planning group, and the president and the VP of the SEC, the Student Executive Council, sit on that. So we're saying we want to be as transparent as possible because we want you as a stakeholder to be able to make some decisions alongside us. So there is no generic stuff. You've got to be absolutely unique and communicate what your uniqueness is. What is the distinction? What is the distinguishing factor between you and another business school? Okay, then let's move forward. So transparency. Not sure what is meaningful. So for instance, that means one school where the placement salaries are audited by Crystal. So we are, we are absolutely open and we say to people, hey, you can come and check our numbers. You know what? We are 100% placed. We are 100% placed. You can check our numbers. We are very happy to put things up on the web because there is no fudging. There is no manipulation. So you've got to be extremely open and transparent. Communication is extremely central. So if, as a school, we don't communicate with the stakeholders. We really don't communicate anything. And therefore, you know, we have a system at TAPME where we communicate with students on a regular basis. So the director communicates, the city management communicates. Uh, so the student body is aware of what each of us are doing. So how does TAPME innovate? There are a few things we just put together, brand scan. So a couple of our students are here. Um, Abhay and Lakshmi, they're here outside with the brand scan stall, so you should probably have a chat with them to get an understanding of what is brand scan, why TAPME is the only school that does it. SMIC is a course that we run, where I run this course, where TAPME gives real money to students to invest in the financial markets. Remember, it's not simulation, it's real money. Uh, we have the most amazing Bloomberg lab, finance lab, 16 Bloomberg terminals, seven Reuters terminals, whole set of Six Sigma, Omega is an amazing world. There's a lot of social work with the district commissioner and the local government bodies. LADC, TAPME is one school that has a fantastic program on leadership development. We believe that everybody has the potential to be a really good leader. So, so this is how we innovate. This is a classic example of how a school innovates, makes the chemistry between the school and the student very relevant, and also communicates with the recruiter, who's the final person who kind of picks the students to say, hey, listen, we're also connected with you, right? So brand construction. So we're talking about how do you manage perceptions, uh, there are expectations, how do you meet expectations? You, do you update yourself? You know, are you still using the 1929 context? Have you moved on and have you really looked at our faculty upskilled? Do you have faculty who are research active? Do you have them with full PhDs? So that's kind of updating yourself and a sense of belonging for both all stakeholders, faculty and obviously the student community. So that's how you construct a really good brand. And a brand construction doesn't come cheap. There's an enormous amount of time, resources, money spent and sucked into this construction of a brand. So how do you build legacy? Uh, so here are some examples. Uh, very quickly, we'll just go through the TAPME legacy. Uh, 1980, we were established as MIM, Manipulative Management, renamed as TFI in 1991. We had the AACD recognition, uh, then Brandscan, which you will see outside, uh, some very interesting brochures to, be, to have a look at. The first marketing fair was organized. Then we had a, a unique MIP, which is a management and practice. Uh, was done, then we had the two five stars grade in 2001, and then we go on to have more legacy. We have the NBA recreation, uh, the Blue Ocean Strategy that was done in 2010, with the first school to actually get the ASCs in 2012, and a repeat feat, which is very hard to perform uh, in 2017, April 2017, when we got re accredited by the AACT, uh, sorry, WACSB, and now we are going to uh, go for AMBA, which is the Association of MBAs, which is a UK body that also occurs. So it's a double crown. So that's something that, that's on our, that our screen. Um, so then we talk about different kind of customer. So here's a customer who is basically a recruiter kind of stuff. So he's going to look at the, somebody in the morning spoke about, actually somebody asked a colleague of ours, uh, what is the rigor at TAPME, academic rigor? And the rigor is very high. And there are two students who will tell you stories about how rigorous the academic programs are. And it is, because rigor is what TAPME prides itself on. Industry relevance. She, uh, that's why I keep saying that you know, the practice and the theory are two distinctly different things, and you've got to be able to match them. If you're a theory guy, you're sitting somewhere, and you're a practice guy, you're sitting somewhere else, you're absolutely dead. There is no connection. So business schools to be relevant must be 
relevant, that is industry relevant, and that means that you must bridge the gap between the theory and the practice. Mm, obviously, we won't have certification staff, leadership program. It's kind of a different kind of ball game we are now looking at. So here is David Ecker again. So we are talking about the need to brand it or lose it. A brand strategy can enable sometimes, crucially, the potential of an innovation to be realized. There are times when you literally need to brand it or you will lose it. And so that's why it's, it's quite important to talk about you know, branding. So what is the mission 2030 for TAPME? The mission 2030 is for a student who's probably about to enter the business school, should probably have a dilemma. Oh, am I? It's between IMA versus TAPME. So really, and that's if you take this as top business school. I'm not being overly arrogant about the fact. I think we are very, on a very wonderful wicket. I mean, if you look at the research performance of TAPME, we are miles ahead of many schools. Uh, we do very high quality research. Uh, our innovation in pedagogy is second to none. Uh, we are continuously upskilling. So our faculty go to Harvard Business School to do a lot of case study training. So we, we are aware of what are the kinds of things and how you are industry, industry relevant and how you're connecting yourself to the top business schools. Uh, we don't hire anybody without a PhD, right? And our CAT cutoffs are also quite high on the 90s. So we are also looking at very high quality students. We have huge recruiters who come to the school. So my question is, I mean, why can't a school have a vision? I mean, the point is, you know, you have to dare to dream, but not be foolish, but you have to dare to dream. And those are very good set of indicators and parameters on which TAPME could easily make the cut uh, to be one of those top schools in the country. I mean, we currently ranked, what, 18, 17, 16. I think it's fairly uh, not accurate because the ranking agencies have got their own methodologies to deal with. And I don't think that's a debate we want to enter today. But suffice to say that if you're looking at a, at a private school, then I would say TAPME is in the top two, three. And if you're looking at research, for example, quality of research in journals, TAPME is in the top five in the country. Uh, so our numbers, uh, which 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 quite credible, uh, clearly prove that. So let's let's have a look at. I want to give this example of Harvard University, right? I mean, you know, if tomorrow Harvard said we don't want to market, it, it'll be absolutely fine. Let me tell you something. Even Harvard is going to unbelievable lengths, unbelievable lengths, to solidify its position in the higher education marketplace. Why would the Harvard Business School need to do anything? I mean, they can close their eyes, put their feet up. They have $30 billion. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry would love to go to Harvard, and they can't make it. They have an amazing set of students, great faculty. But yet, they are complaining. They're saying, we just can't lose the number one spot. For them, it's number one spot. We will not allow UC, UC Chicago, to be number one. Right? So even they're innovating. I mean, Harvard, you know, Cambridge, at Cambridge and Oxford, you don't have PowerPoints. They're sliding green boards, and that's how it's taught. Even now, even today at Cambridge and Oxford, you're taught using green boards. It's not necessary to innovate that way. It's just everybody knows the quality at Cambridge. Everybody knows what happens at Oxford. That's how they are, right? So even Harvard Business, business School and the university is going to great lengths. So let's look at what is brand about. Brand is about, in fact, the previous slide didn't come up. OK, so let's look at what educational brand is about. Excellence, innovation, and legacy, right? So if you're not excellent, if you're not innovating, if you have no legacy, I don't think we have hope in hell to be a really good brand. So if I want to sum up, I can say this, that for, for a business school, and for an educational brand, it's as clear as blue sky that you are no different to a commercial brand. Absolutely no different. Yeah, the challenges are slightly different, but largely you're going to fight the same sort of battle. You're going to be extremely on top of your on top of your game. Only then you can be a brand that people will remember and people think, you know, that's the school. I want to be. I'm so proud that I went to that school. Right. So that's that's where we are. Thank you for your time. Happy to take any questions. And I also want to thank the Brandscan team for a magnificent job that they did working on the slides. So Abhay and Lakshmi are here, and the whole set of 26 people. So if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them.